Thank you. Uh, it was such a nice drive. Thanks to Melissa and the committee uh, for hosting me today. I'm coming to you from Clark County, Wisconsin, the middle of the state, uh, the largest county there. We have 66,000 cows and 32,000 people, so a uh, pretty rural space like many of you are used to. Uh, but what we're going to talk about and work through this morning, we have a lot of ground to cover in an hour, uh, is advocating for agriculture. And uh, as an on-farm nutritionist, and I grew up as a farm kid, uh, I knew that the disconnect between the average consumer and the farm uh, was big, but I didn't realize how large that gap was until I started volunteering for a group called Common Ground. And Common Ground is funded by, originally by corn and soy checkoff dollars. And there's about 120 volunteers. We work at consumer events, uh, things like dietitians conferences, women's expos in Minneapolis, and people would wait in line to come in and talk to us. And it was there that I really got an up-close look at how large the gap is. So what I want to share with you today is a lot of things that I've learned along the way. Uh, as I get to travel and speak, I spend about half of my time with agriculture groups, farmers, producers, growers, ranchers. Uh, and then I spend the other half with kind of non-farm people. Uh, I spend a lot of time on universities. I go to a lot of di state dietitian conferences uh, from here to China. Uh, so I've traveled internationally as well. And certainly I think my message has shifted a little bit over time. We've all heard the adage, you know, we need to tell our story. But I really think that there's some important points in there, and it's, it's more than that. This isn't just about telling your story. So the language of leadership, it really is about leading the conversations about agriculture. Let's see if you can wake this thing up. <coughs> So what I want us to think about is what does advocating for agriculture mean to you? And I think we all would agree with this, that an industry that feeds us is one that's worth fighting for. And this is one of my favorite quotes uh, from JFK, that our farmers deserve praise, not condemnation. Their efficiency should be cause for gratitude. That's something for which they're penalized. But we do feel attacked all the time. We, we see these words everywhere in the media. We need to transform our food system. If you read any emails that come from USDA, read the disclaimer that's at the bottom. We hear this from our own Secretary of Agriculture all the time. We need to transform our food system. Well, I can tell you, friends, as someone who travels internationally and across our entire country, but when you get outside of the United States, and many of you maybe have as well, what is the one thing that every farmer wants to be? outside of the U.S. They want to be you. You are the leaders in growing and raising food. They want the access to technology and innovation that you have. You do it better than anyone else. You produce more food using fewer resources than anywhere around the world. So let me ask you this. I'm all about words and communication. If you woke up in the morning and you rolled over and looked at your spouse or significant other and said, you know, honey, I love you but we really need to transform you. <laughs> it probably wouldn't go well. Why are we talking about transforming something that we love? Because I think we all agree in this room, we love agriculture, it's why you do what you do. It's not for anything other than that. So why are we using these words? And agriculture is under it. So there really is this war on messaging. We know that people get their information about agriculture from a lot of different places. Uh, Hollywood, school, food labels, Google, everything on the internet is true, right? But the three big ones that I want to focus on today are media, activists, and politics. And my question when we look at this is, well, where is the farmer and rancher and grower voice in these conversations? And where are the agribusiness professionals? Where are all of your suppliers and people that you write checks out to every month? Where are they in the conversations as well? Because agriculture supports a lot of people and jobs outside of the farm gate. I like this graphic from the American Ag Alliance, or from the American Ag Alliance. And this just shows all the animal rights activists in the web and how they're all connected, all the organizations. Every line on there is some sort of shared resource. So it's dollars, it's board members, and they really are intertwined. And when I look at something like this, I look at this because this is our competition. When we talk about this war on messaging, why does it feel like we're under attack? It has a lot to do with this. 
well-organized, well-funded people who don't like what we do. Uh, this is a pretty comprehensive list that I've put together. Uh, I started lobbying at the Capitol in Wisconsin two, three years ago, three years ago. And these, this is a list of a lot of the groups that I lobby against. And I'm sure if I were to put one together in the state of Michigan, it would look very similar. And yet, we could probably all name how many ag lobbyists we have working at our capitals. The list is nowhere near this size. So this <coughs> is our competition. And the one thing that it gets done better than what we do is this repetition. Now, this is one of my favorite quotes from Daniel Kahneman, that a reliable way to make people believe in falsehoods is frequent repetition, because familiarity is not easily distinguished from the truth. I can do this experiment in front of any audience uh, outside of agriculture. I can stand at, in any lecture hall at any university and ask the students, finish the sentence. GMOs are, and they will all say, bad. Pesticides are, bad. They can't explain what they are, how they know that, but they know that they've heard it enough times. And when you repeat something enough times and you hear it enough times, it becomes the truth, right? We have to transform our food system. We start hearing messages over and over and over again, and it's this frequent repetition that we don't do very well. Because we're all busy. We tell you something once, you should have gotten it, right? We do that to everyone on our farms. How do we train employees most of the time? I showed you, I told you. Why do I need to repeat myself? Who has time for that? So how can we amplify the message of success of the American farmer? Especially because we have great momentum post-COVID. What did people see? They saw empty shelves. Uh, this headline, Farming Rises, Sports Tumbles in U.S. Industry Ratings. This was a Gallup poll that came out right after COVID. It looks at the popularity of a number of different industries around, across the United States. So who's always at the top? Sports, Hollywood. But this is the first time farming made it to the top. But why? Because suddenly we all became very important as food producers, especially as consumers saw empty shelves. So what I want to impress upon you today is that we can all make a difference, and we have to lead the conversation in the three things, to speak up and shape the story, to get more politically involved, and then engage with our membership groups. This is a picture of Simon Sinek. If you haven't ever seen him, look him up on YouTube. Uh, he is one of my favorite humans. He does business consulting for large companies around the world like Apple and Microsoft. He talks all the time about value and value propositions in business today. That value is a perception, not a calculation. It's something that people feel. It's not something we tell them they get. And we, one might argue that our dairy industry maybe hasn't done the best job of this. We've told people to drink milk forever. Why? Because it's good for you. Duh. Now that may be true, but that messaging doesn't sell the value of how we raise our animals, what we do on our farms every day, the value of our farmers. And we have to reshape the hero and the villain. Every good story has a hero and a villain. And too often, the story is being told outside of this room that we're not the heroes. And we have to stop educating and correcting and persuading and winning. And this is probably one of the things that I've shifted the most in my speaking when I talk to groups and I do trainings. Because so often when people say something about agriculture that we don't agree with, what is our instinct? We get offended usually. And what do we want to do? We want to instantly what? Correct them. We want to puke our knowledge all over people. We have to stop puking on people. It's not working. And sometimes, and this requires a little bit of a shift in our mindset, really what we want is people just to think about something a little bit differently. We want to offer different perspective. We don't need people to think like us, <coughs> even though that's what we want so badly. But remember, if you are a food producer today in the United States, you're outnumbered 99 to 1. It's just over 1% of our population is doing what you do. We can't possibly get people to understand every little facet of how we grow and raise food today. But we do want people to think about things oftentimes differently than what they may have heard. 
So this notion of educating, correcting, people don't want to be educated. It implies that you don't know what you're talking about or that you're not very smart. We don't need to correct them. We do have a great story. We, we can stick to the story. But this isn't about persuading or winning or getting people to think exactly like us. It's oftentimes just about offering different perspectives. And farmers, ranchers, growers are the solution, not political ideology, not this transformation of our food system. And the message that matters the most is really what you do. That you're always improving the care for your animals, the land, natural resources. There's no one way, one size fits all way to farm. And at the end of the day, no matter who does the consumer research, doesn't matter if it's the Center for Food Integrity, doesn't matter, farmers are still the number one trusted resource today in the conversations about food and farming. So your voice is invaluable. But we need to do better. And the art of communication is the language of leadership. So just a little crash course. I like this acronym. It's easy to remember, practice, uh, and important. So the first part of this acronym, the E, is to engage. Engage in a conversation. Look for a connection. But the most important thing we can do in how we're communicating is acknowledging. If you remember nothing else from my talk today, this is the most important point. We have to acknowledge that all consumer concerns are valid whether we agree with them or not. And sometimes it's hard to do. There's little easy, easy things that you can remember. If you can remember these, if you can say something like, hey, I understand why you're concerned about that. There's a ton of misinformation out there. But on our farm, we actually do this. Or, that's a great question. I've actually seen this. Or, I'm glad you asked. It causes a little break in the conversation. This, by the way, works in person. It works online. No matter how you're communicating, we have to acknowledge that all consumer concerns are valid, whether we agree with them or not. I'll give you an example. I was working or volunteering at a common ground event in Minneapolis. It was a women's expo. And when we pop up our booth, our common ground booth, we have all the hot button issues of the day on it. Uh, are GMOs safe? Are there antibiotics in my milk? Is local better? Is grass fed healthier? And people wait to come in. And I watched this woman wait in line at a trade show for several minutes, which is a long time when you can just keep walking around. She looked visibly distraught. She got to the front of the line. It's my turn. She looks at me and says, when I'm driving down the interstate and I see those cattle trailers, I can feel the animal's fear. So what do you do? First of all, there really wasn't a question there. She just wanted me to know that she's mad. And she doesn't like it. So I said, what is your name? Sally. I said, hi, Sally. I'm Kim. Nice to meet you. I'm sorry that happens to you. That doesn't happen to me, but I'm sorry that happens to you. But did you ever consider that we move animals a lot between farms, and some of the cattle trailers that you see with those cows might be going to a better home than where they came from? Now, it was like a huge weight was lifted off of poor Sally. I did not need to get into a big discussion with her about humane slaughter or anything like that. I just needed to give her a little different perspective on how to think about it. Because at the end of the day, you always have a ripple effect of communication. Because I guarantee you that Sally hangs out with other Sallys that I'm not hanging out with and you're not hanging out with. But she'll share that story when that gets brought up in conversation again. Now, I don't need her to understand what we do, why we're moving cattle, that many might be going to a plant. <laughs> That's not important. The important part was Sally felt heard. There was a break in the conversation. What's your name? I'm sorry that happens to you. That doesn't happen to me, but I'm sorry that happens to you. But did you ever think about it like this? She doesn't need to love what we do. Sometimes people need to hate us less, and that's winning for us. We have to shift our mindset. We don't need everyone to think like us. But we have to acknowledge that all concerns are valid, whether we agree with them or not. Then we share. Now we talk about what we do and why we do it. And the words you choose. Words are important because they shape perception. Remember, we started this talking about transforming our food system. What does that even mean? 
but when we're explaining things, explaining it in ways that people can understand a little bit better. So when I'm talking about pesticides, yes, I use the word pesticide, but when I explain it, I'm talking about it's what we use to prevent bugs or weeds or fungus from eating or stealing nutrients from our crops. It's our job as farmers to protect our crops. Do you hear the words and the words that shape perception? Fertilizers and nitrogen, I guarantee you, everyone's heard that they're bad. But the most important thing is, well, why are we using them? How can I help you understand it or think about it from a little different perspective? We nurture plants with nutrients at the right rate at the right time so our crops grow and thrive. Seed treatments, all the new biologicals on the market. I always talk about seedlings. We coat the little seeds, the little seedlings. They sound cute, but that's what they are. Our crops compete with 30,000 species of weeds and 10,000 species of plant-eating bugs. It's our job as farmers to protect our crops. <coughs> when I'm doing farm tours, hutches, it's the nursery. I'm sure many of you do farm tours. Think about the words that you use when you're giving farm <laughs> tours. TMR. I was at an airport one time talking to a lady about how I balance TMRs for all these different cows and different farms. And after about five minutes, she looked at me and said, so is a TMR like, is that like a shot you give them or something? And I thought, well, that's, that's important, Kim. Why, how would she know what a TMR is? You speak farmer, I speak farmer. There's not many people who do. So if I can say that a TMR is a balanced cow casserole, because that's what it is, so can you. And explaining the why. We custom balance cow diet for over 60 different nutrients every single day. And why? Because cows eat better than people. Activity monitors. If you have them, what a cool story to share. We had Fitbits and Apple Watches on our cows long before it was cool. And why? Every 15 minutes, a wireless signal goes to the computer. It's tracking your steps, comparing it to the average over the last week. Why is that important? Because if a cow's steps go down, I know to go take a look at her. Because I know a cow, her steps will go down about 12 hours before she gets a fever. So I'm going to go look at her and see. Does her eyes, do her eyes look bright? Does her hair look nice? Does her belly look full? Is she just lazy today? And if her steps go up, we can go check the calendar. She might get a date night tonight. <laughs> and people will understand that. GMOs and gene editing, it's about precise plant breeding. It's not about productivity. It's always about improving. So being conscientious of the words that we use that shape perception. So some of the hot button things people are still talking about, GMOs, it's just about offering different perspective. I don't care if you plant GMOs or you don't. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, I really fight hard to protect the use of science, technology, and innovation in how we grow and raise food. This is just a tool that farmers can use. It affects one to three genes. Corn, cotton, canola, alfalfa, sugar beet, papaya, squash, soybeans and now some other specialty crops coming in to the space. But people will say to me, well, I just don't like them because I think they're scary. What do I say? I understand why you think that because there's a ton of misinformation out there. But do you know where the gene came from that makes everything Roundup ready? That's our most prevalent GMO that's planted, that's planted on our planet today. It came from a petunia. All proof of concept was done for the Roundup ready gene in a petunia. And then I always follow up and say, and I don't think petunias are scary. <laughs> and I have yet to have anyone say, yeah, I do think petunias are scary, kid. Let's arm wrestle about it. <laughs> or not safe. <coughs> oh, I don't think we should eat them because you know they're banned in Europe. I know why you think that. Because again, there's so much misinformation out there. But that's not entirely true. They're not banned in Europe. They don't allow their farmers to plant them but they are approved for safety in the EU. They import them all from us. They feed them to their livestock and their people. They just don't allow their farmers to plant them because it's very political. Offering different perspectives. And I always love hearing how the technology is used in other industries. If anyone takes insulin, you no longer take insulin that was harvested off of the slaughterhouse floor from the pancreases of pigs. Now it is all insulin is grown in an agrobacterium in a lab using GMO technology. Oh my word. Or cheese. I'm a cheese head. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not, notice I did not have any Packer jokes. 
<laughs> or Aaron Rodgers in his dark place. Um, <laughs> suddenly the talk took a turn. Um, cheese. All cheese is made from a rennet that is grown in an agrobacterium in a lab using GMO technology. Rennet is what separates a curd from a whey. There's one plant-based rennet that doesn't work with all enzymes. All other rennet comes from a lab using GMO technology. Uh, and so we have gene editing now. And agriculture is going to have this great opportunity to use this technology. This is coming to us from the human health side of things and, and cancer research. But now we're able to use CRISPR. We have non-browning apples because of gene editing technology. This is precise plant breeding, but it's gene editing within a species. So a GMO is one to three genes inserted into a species. This is gene editing within a species. Non-browning apples, we can reduce food waste. Potatoes, same story. We have bananas, more resilient against the fungus that was wiping them out because we're using CRISPR. But what's coming? Wheat without gluten. That's a consumer benefit, isn't it? Coffee without caffeine, so we don't have to mechanically remove the caffeine from the coffee bean anymore. Improved nutritional value of vegetables and fruits. And how about peanuts for people who have peanut allergies? So science is cool, and our enthusiasm for science and technology and innovation is contagious. We just have to make sure that we're sharing it and offering different perspectives. And at the end of the day, I think the simplest message that we oftentimes forget is that healthy plants make healthy food. I love sharing this, especially with dietitians. Let's set a picture up. Corn borers, do you not have them in Michigan? I have some, I'll bring them next time. I'll share. <laughs> so if you have corn borers in your field, you're obviously going to do something about it. Next year, if you're planting corn, you might plant GMO corn, BT corn, you might spray the BT protein. Doesn't matter to me which, which way you, which route you take. But what do we know about corn? Corn is a resilient crop, it wants to live. So under the right conditions, when corn is stressed out, let's say it's getting attacked by these nasty little corn borers, what does corn do? Under the right conditions, it wants to live, it produces its own toxins, then we harvest it with mycotoxins, now we have to feed binders to the animals. Why? Because the simple message is that healthy plants make healthy food. And Roundup, again, I don't care if you use Roundup or if you don't, doesn't matter to me, but at the end of the day, offering different perspective is so important. And it is all about the dose. You understand this better than anyone else. Glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, is 25 times less toxic than the caffeine that was in my cup of coffee this morning. So am I telling you not to drink coffee? Absolutely not. Am I telling you to drink Roundup? No. But I am telling you to keep it in perspective. I put this picture in here. Has anyone heard of CES, Consumer Electronics Show? It's in Las Vegas every year. Uh, it just happened again. It's usually in February, January, February time, time frame. This is where all the experts in AI, and not AI like our industry, I'm talking artificial intelligence, all the experts converge in Las Vegas, from Silicon Valley, from everywhere around the world, and look at new, the latest and greatest technology in artificial intelligence. John Deere is the first company, ag company, to take an exhibit. Last year, they took a huge combine that had precision ag equipment in it. Uh, I have old college roommates who work for John Deere who called me after the second day and said, you are not going to believe this. So we had a line, the entire show, you can see the line in the picture, of people waiting to sit in that combine and check it all out. And they had two questions, the two most common questions over the course of the Consumer Electronics Show. Remember, these are the smartest of the smart people in artificial intelligence from around the world. What were their two questions? And it wasn't just a couple of times that these were asked. It was thousands over the course of the several days. Number one, is this for Earth? <laughs> and 
when will it be for sale? <laughs> so if we think about that, the opportunities to speak up and talk about what we do and why are absolutely everywhere. And kudos to John Deere for taking the time to go to the CES show. I, I doubt they sold any combines there. <laughs> but how important was it to go, to get in front of people that don't know anything about what we do and showcase some of the cool things that we do? And remember, so I do hear all the time, I don't know why, here I'm going to back up a slide. I don't know why we grow all that all those crops to feed animals, why don't we just grow our food there? Well, when you go west of the Mississippi, there's not a lot that will grow there. The entire United States is not a garden. But what's the important part is all that land that can grow all those weeds and grasses, it's got all that fiber and cellulose that we can't digest when a ruminant can. And U.S. dairy cattle upcycle, 306 over 306 million pounds of food waste every day. The food waste from ethanol plants, from breweries. Think about all the things we feed ruminants and how important that is. And the big discussion right now. Remember, offering different perspectives. Cattle take a beating in all the climate change conversations, correct? Because, well, first it was because they farted. Now we know it's because they burp, right? We've corrected that narrative. But it's the cow burps, it's methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas, absolutely. I'm not saying that we have zero contribution to climate change. However, there's always a big part of that story that's missing, and it's the one that we know better than anyone else. It's this cycle that methane is in. Our cows burp. Methane is CH4. Methane is stored in the atmosphere for about 12 years, 10 to 15. We'll say 12. Okay? It oxidizes out, separates into CO2 and water as rain. That CO2 goes back into the atmosphere and it feeds plants because everyone forgets that CO2, carbon dioxide, is plant food. But it feeds the plants that then feed our cattle. And the process starts all over again. It's called the biogenic carbon cycle. The methane that our cows produce are in that cycle. It's not the CO2 that comes from our vehicles from energy production that sits in the atmosphere for tens of thousands of years. So yes, global warming potential of methane is there. But the other half of that story that we rarely hear is that it's part of the cycle. It's not in the atmosphere forever. And this is one of my favorites as well, because I do think we have to talk about CO2 as an, as an effect that it does feed our plants. Every acre of corn moves eight tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. That's more than what your car produces every year. Take the number of acres of corn you grow, multiply it by eight, make a meme and put it on social media. That's an easy one. Livestock, U.S. livestock are responsible for 4.2% of greenhouse gas emissions. We know transportation and energy are all more. But offering different perspective, if everyone in the U.S. replaced their incandescent light bulbs with energy efficient light bulbs, we would reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 1.2%. If everyone in the U.S. practiced meatless Mondays in the name of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we would reduce them by 0.6%. We have double the impact of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by changing our light bulbs. Different perspective that people have not heard. We also don't talk enough about this about rendering and recycling because I don't care what people eat. I don't care if you want to eat meat or not eat meat. But if everyone was asked to not eat meat, where are we going to get all these other things that we get from cattle? Because in agriculture, we use the resources we have. We recycle better than anyone else. All the adhesives and band-aids, all the collagen that's in our anti-aging creams, some of you will put it on someday. <laughs> That all comes from the visceral fat of livestock. All the steric acid that's in our tires comes from livestock. We get over 120 life-saving pharmaceuticals from cattle because we're really good at recycling and using the resources we have. On-farm conservation practices. 
We have to stop this focus on specific practices or types of agriculture. I cringe every time I hear the latest buzzword. For a while, it was sustainability. <coughs> but now, it's regenerative agriculture. Uh, the people who define all those terms best are people in this room, but they always get hijacked and taken over, and usually in some way used against you somewhere along the way. But at the end of the day, there's 20,000 different soil types, 21 different watershed zones across the U.S. Weather plays a factor. You are the best people to decide what works on your land. And it's not based on the latest buzzword by any means. But we do have a great story to share in terms of all the different things we do today. And you probably don't think about it like that because it's just inherently what you do. But most people don't know any of the terms on here. So these are easy stories for us to share. No-till. Every time you remove car every time you, you move topsoil, you release carbon. So you're trying to use no-till as often as you can. Minimum tillage, conservation tillage. We use nutrient management plans more than ever. We're doing different crop rotations. We're using cover crops more than ever. We're doing split nitrogen applications. We're using buffers and wetlands and digesters. Our plant genetics have improved so much, and they improve every year. Low disturbance manure injections. Precision A, come sit with me, ride in the tractor when it's steering itself, talking to one of the 26 satellites in space, variable rate applying poop where we want it and not where we don't. Because that's what we do in agriculture. And what's the future look like? Nutrient trading. I work with some farms in Wisconsin that are selling their phosphorus credits to municipalities because they have them for sale. Municipalities don't have the capital investment to lower their phosphorus and their equipment. Carbon markets, the Wild West, who knows where that will go. But I'm sure some of you in the room are participating or considering it. And how much of this will be part of our future license to farm? Uh, there's always a discussion about large farms and CAFOs. So I always want to be prepared to offer different perspective. And I always ask people and I turn the question back on them, well, where do you think CAFOs came from? Because oftentimes it's not what they think. It's more generations coming back to the farm. It's neighbors and friends going together to share resources. It doesn't matter how big or small your farm is. The size of the farm has nothing to do with quality. We know that animal welfare is farm size neutral. And if you haven't seen this, this movie, I encourage all of you to watch it. It's on Amazon. It's still on Amazon Prime. Has anyone seen it? I know you're a dairy group, but this is important for you. Uh, because you can see, I know when you watch this, you'll be able to equate this to your situation, how easy this could happen, how easily this could happen to you. Uh, I've met Joey Carter. Uh, he's a great guy. This is about a hog farmer in North Carolina. So you can find information at North Carolina Pork, ncpork.org, but it's on Amazon Prime, and it is worth the watch. Every time a new story comes on, I always make sure to write to the newspaper to offer different perspective when it's something about water and discharges like this. So I put this as an example. I know there's a lot of words on here, but this was a big rain event in Milwaukee. 380 million gallons untreated wastewater found its way into the Menominee, Kinnickinnick, Milwaukee rivers, as well as Lincoln Creek and Lake Michigan. That's all great, and I understand it. Uh, because every municipality has a certain number of controlled releases that are allowed in every state because we can't have sewage backing up into people's homes. I understand that. That would be vastly unpopular. But every time I see this, I do the math. I put it at a six or 8,000 gallon tanker. I write to the newspaper and I say, hey, that's all great. Dilution is the solution. Except keep that in perspective the next time you run a story about something in agriculture or some sort of spill. And notice the words. Remember word shape perception? 380 million gallons of untreated wastewater found its way. Can you see that in the newspaper? A tanker load of manure found its way into the ditch. And then it found its way into somewhere else. That would never be reported in that way. But take 380 million gallons. It's only 47,500 tanker loads of manure that just found its way into the Milwaukee River, the Kinnickinnick, and Lake Michigan. We'd be all over Good Morning America. That wouldn't be allowed. 
So every time I see that story, and I guarantee you the story is, is it happens in every municipality when there's a rain event, I always write to the paper and I say, yeah, that's really unfortunate. Let's just remember this the next time there's some sort of agriculture story that's reported on. So, ease, engage, acknowledge, share, earn trust, <coughs> getting outside your comfort zone. This lady, she's not that scary. I meet her all the time. It's just that she's never met you or me. She gets her information from a lot of different places and she's heard the messages enough times. But she's not scary. So remember, the reliable way to make people believe in falsehoods is frequent repetition. So moving on to how this affects policy. This is where I've really seen the shift in probably the last six or seven years. Is that this, isn't, this is not just about telling your neighbor that we're doing the right thing. That this certainly affects policy. So a few things to consider. Remember transforming our food system. Now, Cory Booker, he's not on the new list of bank committee members. Whoop, whoop. That's good for all of us, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Except I'm sure there will be a fill-in, the next Cory Booker. We'll just, we just have to learn who it is, right? Uh, he, would, he had authored the Federal Reform Act. We need to phase out CAFOs. Uh, we'll buy them out over the next 20 years. That seems reasonable. Um, but I put the question mark up here in terms of the Farm Bill. Because what sort of policy will we see woven into the Farm Bill? Just last week I listened to a Food Not Feed Summit uh, in Washington, D.C. A lot of big name lobbying groups in D.C. were talking about how they do not want anything in the Farm Bill that has any sort of dollars that would be allocated towards anything that could be feed. Now we know the majority of the Farm Bill is nutrition, it's SNAP. But there's still conservation practices. There is crop insurance in there. They want all of that removed because we need to focus on food, not feed. And it's this growing initiative from across the country. And the 30 by 30. So when we look at policy pressure and regulatory incrementalism, uh, this was an executive order under the Biden administration. It's now been renamed uh, America the Beautiful because 30 by 30 wasn't going well. We need to conserve and preserve an additional 30% of the land and 30% of the water by 2030. You look at this map, all the red on this map is federal owned land. So if we're going to get an additional 30%, where does it come from? Not the red space. We are not in red space. And how are we doing it? Uh, we've already seen some creative ways through lucrative conservation easements, designated heritage areas. This is about <coughs> taking productive land out of production in the name of conservation. So what I can say to you as farmers, uh, make sure you have a good relationship with anyone you rent land from because I guarantee you that they are getting solicited. The SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. This battle is still going on. They said not to worry about it. Uh, I never like to hear those words. Normally, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, regulates uh, large publicly traded companies, not farms. But in doing so, uh, they're looking at regulating scope three emissions. Why is that a big deal? Well, scope three emissions filters down to you. So what does that look like? And they, it has been said, and we are being told, publicly traded companies that are subject to the rule very unlikely to seek emissions data from farms. I don't know about you, but that does not make me sleep better at night. Very unlikely. How about we just get an exemption? Then we can sleep at night. So where will that go? And then we have the whole issue of ESG. Has everyone heard of ESG? The environmental, social, and governance criteria. This is non-financial criteria uh, for socially and environmentally conscious investors. This is coming, this is not a new thing, but it is certainly <coughs> picking up momentum in the United States. It started more in Europe and European nations. But what does it mean? Uh, it means when I listen to a banking webinar, they're talking about how they won't be able to lend money to businesses and companies who don't meet this ESG criteria. So what does that mean to you? Well, when you look at the environmental pieces, uh, it's things like 
carbon footprint, emissions data, water usage, how you handle manure, the social criteria is what kind of gender and equality policies do you have for employees? Uh, what kind of working conditions do you have? When you look at the governance criteria, it is what's your executive pay? Uh, it's things like what's your tax strategy? Who did you give political contributions to? So where will this lead? I don't know, but we have to be talking about it. And all we have to do is look at other countries who've implemented more ESG policies that have filtered down to their farms. The picture on the left, the Netherlands. Did we ever think we'd see 40,000 tractors at the capital of mad farmers? And why were they mad? Their government said what? Well, we have ESG criteria. You're not meeting the environmental piece. You have to cut your nitrogen applications and your fertilizer applications. For some of you, it might be 100%. For many of you, it's 50%. And if you don't want to farm anymore, that's too bad. Because this is what we're doing. And they got mad. And it's still not resolved. The picture on the right, Sri Lanka. What a horrible story. Sri Lanka has the highest ESG rating in the world. How did they get it? Last year, one growing season, they said no more chemical fertilizer. We are banning all fertilizer. A third of their land was left fallow. Three quarters of their farmers used chemical fertilizer before this ban. So what's this number even mean? It's based on a 100 point scale. The US is a 51. Sri Lanka got to a 98. Well, good for them. Their people are starving. That's why they're trying to burn their leader's house down. Because they left a lot of land fallow, it affected their tea industry. That's their largest industry. It, it funds three quarters of the dollars that they use to buy food. And what do you think it did when they banned chemical fertilizer? All in the name of what? A 98 point rating on a world scale of ESG? We need to pay attention to how this is affecting other farmers. So as I leave you with an action plan, what can we do? Well, speak up and shape the story. Grassroots level is key. Communication always has a ripple effect, whether you do it in person, whether you do it online. All media is hungry for content, give it to them. And we have to repeat, 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 repeat. Because that's what our competition does better than us. And all media, again, is hungry for content. If you like to write, write a positive story about agriculture for your local newspaper. Write when you see a controlled release from a municipality and do the math, calculate it back to a manure tanker. If you don't like to write, don't do it. You have to find what works best for you. Obviously, social media, you can reach a lot of people. Share other people with it. Share other people's pages and stories. We can amplify our messages on social media easy, easily or easier. Uh, obviously, television as well. If you're brave enough, go ahead and do it. All media is hungry for content. Give it to them. Schools. I'm on my local school board. Uh, I did not, I know. <laughs> How many of you are on your school boards? <coughs> yeah, I'm sorry too. Sorry I missed drinks last night, but. Uh, the message of agriculture is not always told in our schools. And when it is, it isn't always told in the most factual way. Not every school even has an ag program. So there's a lot of creative things. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's egg in the classroom programming that you can help with. I know a number of farms have done adopt a cat programs. There's all kinds of opportunities. If doing something in your local school interests you, please do it. There's not enough of us doing it. On farm events, there's nothing like bringing people to the farm to show them themselves. Uh, you have a lot of people who will help you with it. If this is something that interests you, look at you. What are you doing? Like, they're like, nope. Okay, then you don't have to do it. We did it. <laughs> Super fun. <laughs> but there's nothing like it. It's a lot of work. And list all of your suppliers, all the people you write checks to every month. They'll help you. Or they should. But it's important to get people to farms if we get the chance. And it's something you're willing to do. Uh, get more politically involved. I put this face up here because no one likes politics. I don't like politics. I'm a registered lobbyist. I don't like politics. But I've seen how important they are in the past couple of years and how the message that gets told about agriculture drastically affects <coughs> politics and policy. 
So political giving, it doesn't take a lot. And I hate this too, but political giving should be a line item. It needs to be a cost of doing business. Even the smallest amount can make the biggest difference because there's so few farms that even $25 to a legislator can make a difference. And do they know you? Do your state representatives know you? If they don't, send them a card. You can look it up online, it's easy to find. Send them a card to their office. Hi, my name is, my farm is here. If there's ever an issue that comes across your desk, don't ever hesitate to call me when it's about agriculture. And when you're in district, please come by for, for a tour. Sign your name. They will come. And here's what happens to your card. When they, their staff reads it, it goes into an agriculture file. So when a bill comes across their desk that has to do with agriculture, they pull the agriculture file out. And that's how it works. It's as simple as that. Make sure that you are their resource. They rarely hear from farmers. So know who they are, federal and state levels, uh, and local. How many of you are involved in your local unit of government? Serve on a county or town board? Do you have, do you have town boards in Michigan? Okay. No one? School board. I think that's local enough. Okay, it is. <laughs> Okay, if you're on the school board, you're off the hook for this right, one. Thank you. If you're not, the rest of you are on the hook because I can't tell you how often I'm in a room of farmers and this is the response. And I know you're busy and it is a thankless job. But if you had told me a couple years ago that I would spend as much time as I do now driving all over my state, going to county and town board meetings, defending farmers and farming, I would have said you're crazy. I live in a dairy state. We are the cheese heads, and it doesn't matter. My farms and processors are leaving. Why? Because of this. Because remember that whole list of activists that I showed you at the beginning? Not only the web, but the list? They've had a very concerted effort in my state and yours. And I can say that for certain because you're not on the board. <coughs> They've had a very concerted effort over the last decade to get on the boards because they understand how they can affect policy. Why? There are things going, I guarantee, well, one, check your agendas online. I guarantee you there's ag issues on them. Even when you say, Kim, I'm in a rural area, it doesn't matter because they're talking about roads. They're talking about what you do to the roads. They're talking about livestock ordinances. In my state, I'm involved, my co-op is involved in a lawsuit right now against a small township in northwestern Wisconsin who implemented a large livestock ordinance that says things like, can't be on the roads with implements after 5 p.m. or on weekends. That works when we're doing anything. Uh, you can't have noise above a certain level. You can't have an odor as determined by the town board members. Can have an odor, odor that comes off your farm, or you're subject to a fine. So these things are happening, and roads are always an issue, uh, water quality. So you know that expression we always hear, like, if you're not at the table, you're, you're probably on the plate? That's the truth. Someone from your farm should be attending the meetings, at the very least. And sometimes they're short. But you will be shocked how often you are talked about at the meetings and how decisions get made, and they have no idea what you do. I don't think that the three board members in little Lake Town, Wisconsin, really truly intended to harm farms by saying you can't be on the roads after 5 p.m. or on weekends. They just want to bike on the roads. But if they don't understand or know what you do and there was no one there to stand up for them and offer different perspective, that's how it happens. And engaging with your membership groups. Government relations departments today are often too far, far removed from the farm level. Uh, I see this when I go to the Capitol. A lot of negotiations that get made that I think wouldn't happen if farmers were more engaged with their membership groups on what they need. Because there's so few farm kids, so it's not their fault. But we have to make sure that we're engaged in our membership groups. 
going to the Capitol at the state level and federal, go to fly-ins. Remember, there's nothing like your voice. And never assume that someone is fighting for you. And silence is acceptance. After a bill passes, after a policy gets put in place, after an ordinance goes through, it's nearly too late. How do I fix this ordinance in northwestern Wisconsin? Now it becomes a legal issue. And the only people who win in that are you know who, right? Our attorneys. And hopefully we win so we can be on the ropes. But silence is acceptance. And the person who's most present is the most influential. I know that it is a thankless job to sit on your local board. But all the activists, have promoted to their groups how important it is that they're there. And that's who's on our boards today. So we can all make a difference. We have to speak up, share the story, shift the hero and the villain, sharing little snippets of science, offering different perspectives, not with the intent of getting people to think like us, just offering different perspectives along the way. Getting more politically involved. Send that card to your legislator. Put your farm card in there. Make sure they have your address and your contact information. Invite them out to your farm when they're in the district. And engaging with our membership groups. You pay dues for a reason. And I don't, it doesn't matter to me what you're part of, but we all pay dues to a number of different organizations. Uh, this is a list of some of my favorite resources. I'm always changing this list. If you have a good one that you like to use, please let me know. And I'll also leave my presentation with Melissa, so if anyone wants the slides, you're welcome to them. And there really is no one that can speak up and share the story of agriculture better than you. Uh, you are the most trusted resource with consumers today, and you're not going to say the wrong thing. Uh, too often, I think uh, farmers, not only are you busy, but you're worried that you might say the wrong thing. You won't. Guaranteed. And it's always better to do something imperfectly than nothing flawlessly. Leadership is not a license to do less. It's a responsibility to do more. Advocating for agriculture needs to be intentional. But if each and every one of us does one more thing, we can have a huge impact through our communication. So with that, I'll leave you with my uh, information. If I can ever help you in any way, don't ever hesitate to call me, send me an email. Do we have time, a few minutes, for any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Questions, comments? <coughs> You said you're a registered lobbyist. What are for? What I mean, obviously ag, but what? What yeah. is that? What is that? Uh, well, the story of how that started. I was watching my new governor, who just got elected again. Mm -hmm. Elections have consequences, friends. Uh, and he was talking about this is going to be the year of clean drinking water. And he called out these two women in the gallery, my friends Nancy and Mary. And these two women stood up. I, was, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was sitting on the couch with my kids, and I was like, oh my gosh, I know those two. I just debated one on a stage at the UW. Those are his friends. He obviously needs new friends. So I went online, how to become a lobbyist. I paid my $250. I called my friend, who I know does federal lobbying, and I said, oh, it says I need a principal. What does that mean? She's like, what are you doing? I said, obviously, our governor needs new friends. And she said, well, no one has any money to pay you, Kim. I said, well, it doesn't matter, because if not you, then who? I can't tell you that and not do it myself. Uh, so I started dragging my friend, Lori, to the Capitol um, with me. And we started a little milk verification co-op. So now we do get paid that penny and a half, a uh, hundred weight to do milk verification. Uh, and we, I lobby on behalf of Venture Dairy Co-op, but on all egg issues, uh, we got in, it really became a sighting mess the last legislative session, so I can only uh, guess that there will be more fun ahead because the new session just started. But uh, funny, also a funny story, we did get flagged by the ethics committee because you have to report when you're a lobbyist, it's all, um, it's all public knowledge, number of hours and dollars. So we had to report zero dollars for a couple of couple uh, sessions and we did get flagged we had to explain ourselves they're like zero dollars they're like yeah this is important if not you then who <laughs> so yes uh, technically a registered lobbyist I would say by accident okay. any other questions no questions 
Are you doing a are you are you two doing a farm tour? Did I hear that? <laughs> no, she's like not again. I can't wait to hear your story. Okay, we have a break. All right, well thank you again and thanks for all that you <laughs>